As we end this series called Renew tonight, Pastor Paolo actually mentioned a book to me that I actually I got intrigued and I want to read it too. It's actually called The 3D Gospel. Now, it doesn't mean you wear shades when you read the book and it's three-dimensional. I guess the title of the 3D Gospel is, it says there of how the gospel can solve shame, guilt, and fear. That what he's actually saying in the book is in every culture, in every continent of the world, parang in every culture, there are issues that every continent or every culture faces. Let's say in Africa, the issue there is fear and power. And you'll know some African nations, unfortunately, are actually in a civil war. So the society has always been in fear in fear of slavery, in fear of war, whatever those things are. But not only that, because of fear, they want to compensate it with power. If you notice in Africa, it, uh, the paganistic culture is prevalent. I, I know you heard of the word voodoo, of some magical arts. Why do they do that? To compensate with fear. So that's the issue in Africa. It's actually fear and power. In the Western world, the culture there is individualism individualistic culture. So, ang issue po dun sa Western culture is actually what you call guilt and justice. That means they're for justice. So, if you do something, pay the consequences. And you'll see that in the news when you watch CNN. When someone is, uh, has experienced injustice, the whole society and the whole city is an, an uproar. So because that's the issue there. I want to live in a way where if, I'm, if I do this, I know I will reap the consequences, whether positive or negative. So that's the issue in the Western culture. It's actually guilt and justice. In the Asian region, in our context, more so, I know we all go through what I just mentioned, but more prevalent in the Asian nation is this, honor and shame. In the Asian nations, especially in the Philippines too, our issue more is the honor and shame. We want to make sure, let's talk about that shame. We want to make sure that we don't live in shame, but we always live in honor. You know, we all personally get affected easily when, let's say, you do something bad and it affects your reputation and it affects the whole society and your family, especially your loved ones. Your, sometimes shame is actually caused by what you did that actually affects you and then it affects the loved ones around you. Or maybe shame is caused by someone, not you, but by someone close to you and it affected your reputation. Or maybe for some reason, shame is caused, sometimes it's caused by just a certain situation. You didn't do something, it's not caused by you, it's not caused by your loved one, but for some reason, situation happened and it brought shame. Give you an example, because we're more into honor and shame. Give, just give you an example. Let's say a business went bankrupt. But maybe you grew up in a family where you're full of tycoons. A family of business, successful business people. But yet for some reason, you did not do something bad or someone did not steal money. It's, for some reason, God allowed it to happen that your business went bankrupt. And so what do you do now? There's shame on your part. And then your whole family or some people in your family look down on you. And so there's shame. So shame is actually caused by either someone by someone who did it and it affected you or you caused it to happen but in other situations it just fell into place or maybe you are in a family of you grew up in a family where all of them are dean's listers some of them graduated in ivy league universities international and here you are you studied studied here and nothing wrong with the universities here like UP, right? Nothing wrong. But yet, the family is looking up to you and expecting you. You go study abroad too. You'll be a dean's list. But for some reason, you didn't make it. But then there's shame. So a lot of times, the Asians 
are actually into this culture of honor and shame. And to be truthful to all of us, we all have shame. Maybe some of us got terminated from the job for some reason. And again, you're a family of achievers. You will live in a barangay or in a village or in a circle where it's all about achieving, climbing the corporate ladder of success. But for some reason, you got terminated for whatever. And then there's shame now. So all of us go through this shame. The only difference is the levels of shame. We all go through shame. Maybe it's your past. Maybe it's the people who did it to you, against you, or some situation just fell into place. And that's what I want us to talk about tonight. How can we experience renewal in the midst of shame and dishonor? Because all of us, I don't have to expound on the examples, all of us, I'm not talking about the funny moments. I'm sure we all have unforgettable, funny moments. I want to go deeper, the shame level that brought dishonor, and you feel dishonored for whatever reason. And we want to talk about a character in the Bible who actually felt shame, and all of us can relate to him. It's, his name is Peter, not Peter Pan, but Peter, the disciple of Jesus. And a majority of us know the story of what caused the shame on his part, but I want us to look at it again in Luke chapter 22, just in case we miss the story of Peter that caused shame and dishonor on his part. Luke chapter 22, verse 54. Then they seized Jesus and led him away, bringing him into the high priest's house. This is the night when Jesus was about to be crucified, the night before. And Peter was following at a distance. And when they had kindled a bonfire in the middle of the courtyard and sat down together, Peter sat down among them. This was the night when all the disciples were in fear. So they did not want to be associated with Jesus because Jesus got caught already. And so they were probably watching from a distance just like Peter. In verse 56, six, then a servant girl seeing him, Peter, as he sat in the light and looking closely at him said, this man also was with him. Okay, so there's this little girl who said, I know you. You're one of the closest disciples of Jesus or the BFF of Jesus. And G Peter said, but he denied it saying, Woman, I do not know him. And a little later, someone else saw him and said, You also are one of them. But Peter said, Man, dude, I am not. So second denial. And after an interval of about an hour, still another insisted, saying, Certainly, this man also was with him, for he too is a Galilean. But Peter said, Man, I do not know what you are talking about. And of course, just like what Jesus foretold, and immediately while he was still speaking, the rooster crowed. Denial of Peter. And here's, the, here's something that's, that will make you feel at least regret if you're in Peter's shoes. And the Lord turned Jesus from afar and looked at Peter and Peter remembered the saying of the Lord, how he had said to him before the rooster grows today, you will deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. Now, let me give you a background of Peter. If you are Peter, let me give you that background. You are one of the closest disciples of Jesus for two and a half to three years. Remember, Jesus had 12 disciples and he had 72 as well. But sometimes Peter, Jesus ministers with threes only, by threes. And usually, those threes, one of them is Peter. So you're one of the trusted friend of Jesus. You're one of the closest disciples of Jesus. You're one of the disciples, probably if I were Jesus, I would expect Peter to stand up for me and be with me during this night of ordeal. Before I get 
tortured the day after and I be crucified on the cross, I would want my best friend to be with me. How many of you here, you can relate because you had a best friend who, who's like Peter here? I don't know him. Unfriended you in Facebook, huh? Disowned you in Instagram. Right? So probably this is deeper. I mean, if you're Peter, the most ideal scenario, hey man, this is the night for you. Grab the opportunity. Stand up for him. If you really are a disciple, remember, that's what Peter said. Peter is very vocal. I will follow you. And that's the confession of Peter. Remember, one of the instances, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. So many faith declarations of Peter previous to this. Many faith declarations, audacious statements come from Peter. You are the Christ, the son of the living God. No, you will not die on the cross. That's what Peter said. And Peter said, I will never deny you. Wow. So this is the night. This is the championship night for Peter. This is the best opportunity for Peter to, to stand up and really be a strong disciple and give all of us the best example of how to be a bold and a strong Christian. The best time. If you're Peter, this is the best. Remember, Jesus said, if you acknowledge me before my Father in heaven, he will, I will acknowledge you as well. So this is the time. Come on. So if you're watching a movie, you know, your hands are sweating, right? You know, you're, it's a suspense. It's like when your friends ask you, Christiano ka ba? Are you a Christian? And then you're kind of nervous. You're not yet bold as a lion. You're bold as a, a little bit of a cub. Hmm. Medge. You don't know what to answer. This is the best time, Peter, to stand up and acknowledge that you really are a child of God. You're a strong, staunch follower of Christ. But yet you'll see the other way around. He denies Christ. And then they had an eye-to-eye look with Jesus. Why if you're Jesus? If I'm Jesus... What will I say? I should have sent the demons not to the pigs but to you. <laughs> if I'm Jesus. Sorry, Peter. <laughs> Pure Jesus. They had an eye to eye look. I guess Jesus being human, I can expound my imagination. He would have wanted someone to be with him, to show support. Because in this night, a lot of the disciples ran away. They were watching from a distance and Peter was watching in a close proximity. And if you're Jesus being human, you would want someone, your true, loyal, trusted friend to be with you. And Peter knows that exactly. That's why he wept bitterly. Shame. This is actually the cause of shame in Peter's life. He did something really, really bad. He knows the way, the truth, and the life for two and a half years. He does something big, commits a boo-boo, a major boo-boo. And there's now shame because he knew, I lied, I disowned Jesus. Eh, paano kung si Jesus nag-disown sa'yo? That's scarier. What if it's the other way around? It's Jesus who disowned you. Many times we get ashamed of being Christians. So we can all relate with Peter. And then we go home. While I'm driving or I'm commuting, we start saying to ourselves, I should have been honest. I should have been bold enough to tell my friends I'm a Christian. Probably that was Peter's feelings. Now, it's a mix of regret. It's a mix of dishonor. It's a mix of what ifs. I want to go back to correct it. But that's what Peter was feeling. And you know what sin does? What sin does, it brings shame. When we fail to please society, it can bring shame. When we fail to please God, it can also bring shame. Psychology Today 
I saw an article, it's, it says, shame, a concealed, contagious, and dangerous emotion. When we all live in shame, there are different manifestations that come out and can even affect people in our lives. So from either we condemn ourselves too much, we, dis we disconnect ourselves from people, we isolate ourselves, we become insecure, and the worst thing is shame gone wrong. It's actually Judas. That's shame gone wrong. Remember Judas also felt that, what Peter felt, the regret, the remorse, the guilt. Judas felt that, but she, it was shame gone wrong. He committed and took his life, committed suicide. So that's shame gone wrong. But this is what it means. When you, uh, doc, the doctor said this, as a self-conscious emotion, shame informs us of an internal state of inadequacy. Pag meron pong shame, we start feeling, I'm no longer qualified. Oh man, I, I committed a big sin against God. I'm no longer qualified to be called a Christian. I can no longer be welcome here in church. I can no longer lift my hands to God because I feel inadequate. I'm no longer worthy. That's the, another description of shame. That's the manifestation. And not only that, dishonor. Oh man, I failed my small group. I failed my pastor. And regret. Peter's feelings are these things. Inadequacy, I'm no longer called to be a fisher of men. I remember Jesus calling me to be a fisher of man, but yet I failed. And then Jesus telling me also that I will do great things, greater things than what he's doing. I feel inadequate. I'm no longer worthy to be a child of God. I feel dishonored. I failed the dis disciples. I could have helped the disciples become stronger and bolder, but yet I failed under this dishonor. It's not just affecting me, it's affecting my whole family. It's affecting this church. And regret the what ifs. I want to go back in time and correct it. I'm sure all of us felt that. And what's worse is disconnection. Okay, I don't want to go and mingle with people anymore. I don't want to go to church anymore. I don't want to go to my Bible study group anymore. I just want to watch live stream. Now, if those people are watching live stream, I'm not saying you're in shame. I'm just saying there are people who watch on live stream because they don't want to get connected already in church. Yeah. It's possible. This connection. That's what shame does. I'm pretty sure as we continue to do a SOCO or CSI in Peter's life, this is what he's felt. What he felt. This is what he's feeling. You know, every time when we struggle with shame, that's my question. I struggled with shame. There are things that I've done in the past that I'm not really proud of. And when I realized it was a sin against God, you know, I'm just, oh man, sh shake my head, why did I do that? And then when there's condemnation, I start asking, am I, Lord, am I really a Christian? Am I, am, is my name really written in the book of life? Am I worthy to start leading a small group? Shame. This is what shame does. You know what's bad against, when, when you look at Peter, you know what's bad? So you denied your friend, your Savior, your Lord, that night, right? That's a bad night. You know what's worse? The next day, he dies. You ever disown the friend and the next day the friend dies? You have no opportunity to make bawe. <laughs> you have no opportunity to correct your wrongs because the friend that you love, that you disowned, that you made a mistake against, or you, you offended, died. That's worse. That's bad. Kasi okay lang kung buhay siya. Tomorrow, the next day, okay lang. I would, you know, it would be a good story that, you know, Peter can apologize to Jesus the next day, right? But yet, Jesus dies the next day and was crucified on the cross. And Peter, I'm sure, was weeping bitterly with regret. Now the question is, is there still an opportunity for me to correct the wrong? Patay 
Jesus is dead. Is there still a chance for me to correct it? That's our wish. That's our hope all the time. Every time when we are in regret, dishonor, inadequacy, unworthiness, regret or guilt or shame. We want to correct things. Thank God there's renewal. Thank God the story did not end there with Peter. Because after three days, when you look at the story, Jesus rose from the dead and gave Peter a hope or chance to renew things and correct things, the things that he committed that was actually a mistake. Let's look at it in Mark 16, verse 45. You'll be amazed here in this verse of the turnaround of Peter, of how he was able to turn around from shame to hope. Mark 16, it was a story now when Jesus rose from the dead in the tomb, the stone was rolled away, and looking up, they saw, the women, they saw that the stone had been rolled back. It was very large, and entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, dressed in a white robe, and they were alarmed. And he said to them, do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth who was crucified. The, the person, remember, the person that, that, that Peter denied? The, the person that Peter disowned? He's alive. He has risen and he is not here. See the place where they had laid him. And in verse 7, look at the, what the angels told the women. But go tell his disciples and... Again, tell his disciples and... That he's going before you to Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. Look at this verse. There's something wrong in the picture. Why is this person who denied Jesus three times, the closest friend, the trusted friend, who betrayed and denied Jesus, is still special mentioned here? He could have been part of the disciples, but yet the angel, who's actually just a messenger of God, was mentioning the name Peter, who's the champion. No, not the champion. Wrong. Eh. Who's the coward that night? But yet, he was specially mentioned by God. So if you're Peter, it gives you hope. Remember, the night before, ano yung sa Holy Week? Thursday. Thursday, traditionally speaking, when Peter denied Jesus, after that, he cries in shame, this agony of suspense, what can I do? There's regret. Jesus is dead from Friday. And then on Sunday, he rises up again. And then the messenger says, make sure Peter knows. Wow. A person who's actually living in shame, a person who did something really, really bad, is still specially mentioned by God. What does that tell us? You're always on God's mind. Maybe you're in shame now. You feel dishonored. You feel not valuable. You're no longer worthy. Let me tell you this. You are always on God's mind. You're important. You are valuable. You are still in the very precious, infinite thoughts of God. And that's what what shame does is when we start entertaining the lies of shame is I'm no longer important. My small group leader no longer minds me. The pastor no longer is concerned with me. My family disowned me already. And so that's really the manifestation of shame. Pero when you look at the scripture, even if Peter probably was feeling that, Jesus had a very different opinion still of him. That's how precious and how valuable you are in the eyes of God. So do not believe the lie of shame because here, Peter was living in shame, but the very fact that Peter was actually mentioned specifically by the angel, please make sure Peter hears the news. 
In fact, traditionally speaking, Peter was one of the first disciples to see Jesus alive. He could no longer... Now, when you look at his background, he's not qualified. You'd rather have John the Beloved. You'd rather have a stronger and bolder disciple to see Jesus first. <laughs> Common sense will tell us that. But yet, Peter, of all the disciples who denied him three times, who was a coward that night, still God chose to reveal himself first. That's something else. It's not actually maybe our qualification that will cause God to visit us. It's not the moral qualification now we know why God chooses to reveal himself to you and to me. You know what? It's really just by his grace. Look at Peter. The logic will tell you, okay, if I'm Jesus, I will show up to the kindest disciple, to the most humble. I don't think Peter was humble. Okay, second, I will show up to the disciple who's bold, who did not disown me. So if this is Judas, of course, siguro Peter is second to the last. Right? But yet, traditionally, and Paul said this also in 1 Corinthians, Jesus shows himself first to the disciple Peter. The one who was living in shame. If you're living in shame, I want us to be encouraged with this. You are always on God's mind. Never give up and say your life is no longer worthy and valuable because you did this, you did that. In the eyes of God, your value is still the same. The moment He conceived you in your mother's womb and the moment He died for each one of us, each one of us is valuable in the eyes of God. Do not believe the lie of shame, but believe in His Word. You are important in the eyes of God. So I want us to live and face this coming week knowing and having that confidence you're valuable. You are always on God's mind. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 3, Paul said this, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scripture, for that He was buried, that He was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures, and that He appeared to what? To who? To Cephas, Peter. Then to the twelve. See, the man of shame, ladies and gentlemen, exhibit A, the first person to see Jesus, aside from the women. <laughs> Exhibit A, the most shameful, second to Judas. Sorry to be exaggerated. Second to Judas, but yet the first of the disciples to see Jesus. That's the grace and the mercy of God. What does that tell us? That you don't, you, you sometimes we think, I'm the last person. Probably if there's a line in heaven, I'm the seventh billion person in the line. Probably when I, we all die because I'm the most shameful person here in the planet, probably I'll have the smallest house in heaven. Or probably I'm not going to be walking in streets of gold, I'll be walking on streets of wood. Sometimes that's how we think. Let me tell you, you can't imagine how God values you and how precious you are in the eyes of God. Even sometimes we think we live in dishonor and shame. He can turn your life around. When the world has looked down on you, God has not and will never look down on each one of us. Just like Peter. In fact, I want to give that uh, picture to you. Probably the angel said to the women, please tell all the disciples that Jesus, my boss, is alive. Because the angel. Please tell the disciples that my, our boss is alive. Oh, 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 wait, wait, wait. Before, okay, okay, they're all excited. See, bitch. And the women are all excited. Boy, she's a bitch, boy. 
Probably they're so excited, so they're about to run away from the tomb, right? Run out of the tomb. And then, wait, 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 wait. special announcement. Please write it on your Corona notebook. <laughs> special announcement also. And please, 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 please tell Peter. If you're Peter. If you're Peter. Oh, okay. Please, 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 please tell George it. Let's personalize it. Oh, wait, wait, wait. please tell Michael. Please tell Carla. Please tell Vaughn. Please tell Vince. Whatever our names are. I think that would matter a lot. Please tell Fred. Please tell Francis. Please tell Josh. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Please tell. I want to let him. I want to let that person at least have no, just in case he's still part of the family. I just want to let Peter know he's still part of the family. I just want to let each one of us know that you are still the family of God. You're still a friend of God. You're still a trusted associate disciple of Jesus Christ. Even if you did that, you're so precious in the eyes of God. I want us to understand that tonight. Maybe we're here today, we're swimming in a pool of condemnation, damnation, feeling of damnation, or depression, or shame. Wait, 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 God wants to let you know too, you're still important, and you are still part of His winning team. You're no longer a bench warmer. You're not a bench warmer. You're not a water boy. All the water boys are important. You're still God's friend. How many of you are thankful today by the grace and the mercy of God that whatever we've done in the past, you're still God's friend? You're still a child of God. That's why church is not, actually church is a place where our shame vanishes. Where our shame disappears. The society you're part of probably you're, they look at you as shameful, they disdain you, they look down on you. Here in the church and with the God that we worship, He looks at you eye to eye. Nothing changes. You are still as important. You're always on my mind. Parang love song lang yun, ha? Heaven knows. You're always on God's mind. That's how important you are. Here's the thing. Because of Christ's resurrection, we no longer have to live a life of shame. What if, <laughs> here's a question, hypothetical question. What if Peter did that, right? So he denied Jesus, right? And Jesus did, did not rise from the dead. Jesus is dead. And Peter did not have a chance to see Jesus alive. Do you think Peter will still live a life of shame and regret? He will. He will. In fact, maybe on his deathbed, most probably on his deathbed, he could have lived and died of shame, with shame and dishonor. But it turned around when he found out Jesus was alive and Jesus showed himself first. It turned around. What does that tell us? That Christ's resurrection, because Christ has risen from the dead, it gives you and me the opportunity to live a new life, renewed life, to create, opportunity, to be able to grab opportunities again, to live a life that's honorable towards Him. That, this is the significance of Christ's resurrection. That's why you and me, we got to be thankful the God that we worship is alive because it reminds us that each and every day, His mercies are new every morning. We no longer have to live a life of shame because in Jesus, we can have and experience a renewed life. I want us to face this coming week living without shame when we have Jesus in our lives. We don't have to live a life of shame. Actually, that's, this is the first when Jesus appeared to Peter from <laughs> now they're friends again. It actually never changed. 
That's actually the renewal of Peter when Christ was resurrected from the dead and Christ appeared himself. He appeared and showed himself to Peter. Otherwise, if Christ was not resurrected from the dead, Peter would not have known that he's already forgiven by God. Peter would not have known and will not have an opportunity to stand up for Jesus, to correct the wrongs and the shame erased. And then, of course, we go to the famous passage where Christ talks to Peter, not the first time, but the last moments before he goes back to heaven in John 21. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He's talking about probably we don't know what these are. Maybe the fish, maybe the bread, maybe the other things. He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, feed my lambs. That's your calling. Take care of the church. Take care of the young disciples. Take care of the people who want to know me. Take care of them. This is the opportunity. Remember, the night he denied Jesus three times, but now Jesus is giving him an opportunity to really declare what, he, what his heart is declaring, not out of fear, but out of devotion and authenticity. Because Jesus asks Peter three times too. First it was denial, but now it was the proper declaration. In verse 16, he said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, tend my sheep. You know what's amazing? Is that our calling is irrevocable. Remember what Jesus told Peter from the very beginning? You will fish for people. So Peter thought probably, oh, I'm no longer part of the family of God. Oh, I'm no longer going to be in heaven because I denied him. Oh, I'm no longer, I remember fishing for people, taking care of people. Oh, maybe my calling has been revoked already. I've been disqualified already. But yet here you will see, he's not. He was not, it was not revoked. The calling to take care and love people and be fishers of people is still there. You know, I'm thankful that even though at times I sin against God, we sin against God, the calling of God in your life will never be revoked. Not unless you choose to decide, ayoko na sayo, Lord. Not unless you decide. But then, even in, nothing shall separate us from the love of Christ. The calling is irrevocable. Interesting that you're still qualified to serve. Even though sometimes we think we are not qualified. In verse 17, he said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? Siguro Peter felt condemned again because now God, Christ no longer trusts me or believes in me the second time around. So probably he felt bad. Hindi naman siguro dahil nakulitan siya, no? Maybe not that kind of offense, but probably just he felt like there's no trust anymore. But then Peter said, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. You know what Jesus is actually saying? You're still qualified to fulfill the calling I've given you. Let shame not be a hindrance in fulfilling the calling of God. That's what Satan does to us. Remember. Remember your addictions. Mm, nom, 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 nom. Remember your mistress. Remember your vices. How can you lead a small group? How can you share the gospel? You're not perfect. And with that fork. <laughs> Sometimes that's condemnation. That's not from the Holy Spirit. That's not from God. Did Jesus remind Peter? Peter, remember you denied me? Ayus, ayusin mo ha. 
Okay? Jesus didn't say that. Jesus did not say that. Hey, boy. Hahabul-habul ka sa akin. Ayusin mo. Naalala mo, remember what you did? Thursday night, remember? You know, Jesus did not say that. Jesus just asked and gave an opportunity to Peter, will you stand up for me? Even if I'm gone, I'm in heaven, will you stand up for me? Yes, Lord. Then start taking care of the people I will entrust you. Start taking care. And you're still qualified to do great things in my kingdom. That's how good God is to each one of us. Otherwise, if it's all about perfection, no one will preach here on stage. No one will lead the victory group. No one will be able to serve. No one will be able to bring people to Jesus. Otherwise, if it's all about moral qualities and perfection, but all of us are imperfect, but by the grace of God, we have been qualified to serve in His kingdom. That's how good God is. I'm going to end here. Because of Christ's unconditional love, we can love people the way God loves them. Kaya, that's why Peter's heart changed. Read the epistles of Peter. First Peter, second Peter. His heart is very fatherly now. His heart is very, you'll see, patience, compassion. He's no longer like the Peter, I will never disown you. Yeah! They get away from them. And I think traditional, traditionally, Peter was the one who cut off the ear of one of the soldiers, if I'm not mistaken. Or maybe one of the disciples. But with the impatience and pride of Peter, because now he knows the love of Christ that turned his shame around into a life of confidence and hope. His love for people changed. And that's my hope for us. When we start understanding that Christ loved us unconditionally, that he took away our shame and dishonor, we would be able to love others and see people not with prejudice and pride, but we will start seeing people with humility compassion, mercy, kindness. If I needed Christ, He needs Christ. And that's, that's actually the catapult why Peter was able to preach to thousands. Why people was able to preach and minister to a lot of people because the Lord changed His heart in that conversation. Do you love me? And take care of the people that I have entrusted you with. Let's all stand. You know, when you have Jesus in your life, you don't have to live a life of shame. Some of you I sense in this room or in those people who are watching live stream, you're living in a life of shame and you are having suicidal thoughts. You want to end your life but remember Jesus and the angel telling, please don't forget Peter, he's still important to me. Do not be like Judas, shame gone wrong. But when we have Jesus in our lives, he's the lifter of our head and he takes away that shame and condemnation and assures each one of us that we are still children of God, friends of God qualified to partake and serve Him in His kingdom. Heads bowed and eyes are closed. Lord, I just pray for each one of us here today. Remove the shame in our hearts. Every time we're here and every time we approach You, Lord, Ikaw pa! Of all the people, Lord, You're the only one who will accept us. You're the only one who will love us. You're the only one who will embrace us. So remove that lie. I cannot approach you, Lord Jesus. We can approach you because you paid for that shame 2,000 years ago. If you're here today, you're dealing and battling shame to the point of depression probably to some or societal thoughts. If that's you, you want that shame and condemnation removed. Lift your hands. I want to pray for us. 
So Lord, I just pray for each one of us here today who are battling shame, dishonor, regret. Assure us today, Lord, that society no longer matters. The opinions of people outside no longer matters. What matters is what you tell us. Each one of us are valuable in your eyes. We are always on your mind. Just like Peter, he was on your mind. So Lord, I just pray each one of us, we would be assured and experience you. You're always, Lord. You are always, we are always on your mind. Remove that shame and condemnation as we face this week. Remove that regret. And we will only experience that from you. It's, you can put your hands down. Another prayer that I want to pray for. If you're here today, head, while heads bowed and eyes are closed, if you're here, you've never surrendered your life to Jesus. That's the only way. There is now no more condemnation in Christ Jesus. And you've never surrendered your life and made Him the Savior of your life, the forgiver of your sins, the, ter- the person who will turn your ashes into beauty, and the person who can only renew us. You've never done that. And you want to put your faith in Him. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved, shall be renewed. If anyone is in Christ, He is a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come and you've never received Jesus in your life, just raise your hands. I want to pray for that, an opportunity for you to receive Him as your Lord and Savior, to receive that forgiveness that can only come from Him. While your hands are up, say this prayer with me. Say, Lord Jesus, I make you the Master, the Lord, and the Savior of my life. Forgive me from all of my sins. Take away all my shame because you paid for it on the cross. So by faith, I receive the gift of eternal life. Whoever believes in you shall not perish, but have everlasting life. In Jesus' name, amen. Lord, as we get dismissed, and as we face this week, we will always be thankful and be reminded You are the lifter of our head. You remove our ashes and turn it into beauty. And we can start living a life of confidence and hope because we have you. We know we don't have to please people because you're already pleased with us. We're living for an audience of one, and that is you, Lord. So thank you. Bless your church as we face this week. Protect us even as we get dismissed, Lord. Everything that we'll be doing this week will be blessed because your favor surrounds us, Lord. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your grace. And may we experience it this coming week. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.